where we speak with experts, leaders, and change makers about movements of social change that have transformed the landscape of Canada and the way we live our lives. Today, we're at the Ontario Federation of Labour, speaking with longtime activist in the labour movement, Sid Ryan. So tell me, what inspired you as an activist, as, as someone who decided to get involved in the labour movement? What was it about? Um, I guess I could say it probably started in Ireland, where my father was uh, involved in the labour movement. Um, he was um, a shop steward uh, for the auto workers. And, um, and I watched as he uh, engaged in a, in a strike and a lot of the meetings were held uh, in our home. So, uh, so that kind of uh, intrigued me as a 12 year old, 13 year old, uh, watching this unfold. And then I came to Canada in my early 20s, I was 21, 22, and um, I got a job in a factory in the east end of Toronto. And uh, I was approached by a bunch of guys, uh, one in particular actually from the Caribbean, uh, from Jamaica, and uh, he asked would I help to organize a union. Now I didn't have a lot of experience at, uh, at um, trade unionism in Ireland other than what, what I saw my father, I saw how I saw him engage uh, you know, in my, in my teens, early teens, but uh, they felt because I was Irish that in all likelihood I must know about unions, <laughs> which is not true at the time, but in any event. So we engaged in this uh, organizing drive and primarily the organizing drive it became about as a result of um, there were uh, no people of color whatsoever in any supervisory role anywhere in the plant. Mm -hmm. And there was over like a thousand workers there. And um, so all the supervisors, even the lead hands were all white and none of them were, were people of color. And I just felt that there was something wrong with that. And um, so I started to work with these folks. I had the opportunity to travel around the plant because I was a maintenance person. And, uh, and they were stuck kind of out in the mill area, in the receiving area. So, uh, so I became sort of the main contact in the plant and I got the bug. We, we, managed, to, um, we managed to successfully organize the, um, the factory. And the interesting thing about it was we got at least two or three wage increases along the way. Yeah trying to keep the union out and the, the company was trying to say, oh, you know, we're good guys. And so they gave us wage increases, but we took the wage increases, of course, and we organized as well at the same time. And then we got a bigger increase after we organized. So that was the beginning of it. I left that factory uh, after about a year or so, and I joined Ontario Hydro. Uh, went to their nuclear training center up in the Ottawa Valley. And the union there was, uh, was CUPE. And then I began, I guess, because I had the bug from uh, my earlier experience in Toronto, uh, I became uh, actively involved. I moved from the Deep River area, which is the training center, mm -hmm. up to the Bruce Nuclear Power Plant, and within weeks of being uh, in the, um, the, uh, was the heavy water plant, basically, within weeks of being there, I became a shop steward. And there began the, the climb, if you will, up the ladder, uh, shop stewards and chief stewards, and, um, became plant chairperson, I moved to Pickering Power Plants, became plant, uh, plant chairperson, and then eventually became the president of QP Ontario. And How long were you there for as president? Uh, I was 17 years in, in QP as the, as the president. Long time. Yeah, as the yeah. longest serving president. Uh, yeah, so um, that was, the, they were good years, and I, I really enjoyed that time. And when did you come to the... The OFL, I came here in uh, 2009, okay. so almost six years ago now. Okay. Um, and so as someone who has watched the labor movement grow uh, incredibly right. over the years, uh, what would you say are the, the sort of the biggest achievements, biggest gains it has made in Canada? In recent years or, or just period? Uh, period. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, well, you know, we're part of the movement, I guess, that's moved us into the weekend, right? Uh, I mean, we say that a lot of people is the unions uh, brought you the weekend. Um, the eight-hour day, and we, we brought the eight-hour day. Obviously, child labour was was eliminated uh, underneath the um, underneath the uh, the march towards social justice for the labour movement. Um, and then in, in later years, then we started to move into um, pay equity, mm -hmm. uh, where we started to uh, agitate for for women to be paid the same as men. And that gap still hasn't been closed. It's still like women still earn only seventy percent of what a, what a man earns out there on average. Um, well, so, do you remember what it was when you first started fighting for it? Um, 
No, I, I can't say I, I actually recall mm. uh, what that gap was, but we did bring, uh, we brought in pay equity. So therefore, all of the women in the public sector, for example, um, they automatically got massive wage increases because they all moved up yeah. uh, to um, to be, if you were doing a job that was comparable to what a man was doing, you basically got, uh, got the same wages. Um, so we actually moved more people, but for of those still who do not have pay equity, uh, that gap, you know, it was about 60%, now it's about 70%. It hasn't moved a lot anywhere in the world, by the way. It isn't just here in Canada. Right. Uh, that gap remains, uh, there might be an odd Scandinavian country that may have uh, more equality than what we've got here. Um, paternity leave was another big one um, that unions fought for. Uh, that spreads. We, we see the way we do it is we negotiate it in a collective agreement. Mm -hmm. It applies to that particular workplace. And then, if it becomes popular, then more people will start to negotiate it. The more people negotiate it, then the political agenda uh, starts. The uh, political machine begins to get politicians to start right. to think about bringing in legislation. Right. So, uh, so that was another big one. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, the public sector in itself, um, you know, essentially winning the right to be able to uh, participate in politics uh, and to be able to join a union, basically. Uh, you, you know, you go back um, 40, 50 years, uh, the public sector, you were deemed to be a conflict of interest, not able to be part of the union. Now today, 70% of the labor movement, they're public sector employees. Mm -hmm. uh, the outnumber the private sector employees. Now, that's good and it's bad. It's bad in the sense that it means that we're losing Good paying manufacturing jobs uh, in the private sector. I'll go to China and to uh, Mexico, and uh, so consequently, their their the percentage of organised workers in the private sector is dropping dramatically, and there's a huge increase in the percentage of workers in the public sector uh, who are now organised. So consequently, we've kept the uh, the density, the unionisation rate in Canada to be relatively stable over the last number of decades. It's about thirty percent right now. Uh, in its heyday, it was probably closer to 40%, but we've lost marginal, marginally, but in the United States, they've dramatically dropped down to something like 11%. Uh, right. yeah. um, so, sort of touching upon that, what are the challenges that, I mean, even an evolution of challenges, has the challenges changed, and what are they today in terms of... Um, privatization is, is top of the list, I think. Um, privatizing public sector jobs, um, the whole march of um, globalization, uh, free trade agreements that are undercutting the rights of workers, uh, making it easier to ship jobs uh, offshore, basically, um, giving uh, multinational corporations uh, the power to be able to sue governments uh, in the event that they believe um, if a service, uh, let's say for instance, the procurement of of books in, uh, in the education sector, um, if that's not put out to a tender, and um, uh, you know if you have a free trade agreement with Europe, which we're which we're looking at right now, mm -hmm. so if the Europeans are not allowed to bid on you know uh, producing the books for the education sector in Ontario, they could sue the government and basically say that was a potential loss of earnings for us um, because you violated the right. agreement and you didn't put it out the tender. Um, so those kinds of, of issues uh, are, are very real and it's looking like that these free trade agreements are agreements about corporations, they're not about people, they're not about the sovereign nations, mm -hmm. um, you give up a lot of your sovereign powers. So they're, they're like, no question about it. Um, the whole issue of austerity, we're seeing it right now in, in, uh, in Greece, uh, where the, you know, the European Bank um, or the IMF are demanding that they increase uh, taxes on, on, not on corporations as you, as you would like to think, but no, uh, on individuals. Um, they want to see pensions being cut and they want to see wholesale um, selling off of the private sector, of the uh, public sector. So everything from transportation to education to healthcare, they want it all privatized. So that's the challenge of the day right now, I think. And in terms of you personally, the work that you've done and, and the stuff that you're most proud of over the years, uh, you've done a lot. So I'm curious what you would sort of... Um, the highlight, I think, for me would be if I was to pick out any one particular issue that I championed, um, I think I'd have to say human rights and uh, social justice issues are the ones that I'm particularly interested in. Um, you know, I, I do it even here at the OFL. I try to open up the labor movement. Um, I'm a firm believer that we ought to be seeing more people of colour in leadership. 
um, the union movement's future rests with all of the immigrants who are coming to Canada from all around the world. And if you go to our conventions and look at them, they're still relatively white. The leadership, and generally speaking, guys look like me, and I'll say guys because it's mainly mm -hmm. men who are in leadership roles in the labour movement. There are some women, obviously, but but uh, not nearly enough. But um, the, but there's definitely not nearly enough people of colour. So that is the challenge I think for the labour movement. We either we either open it up and uh, and understand that um, you know. Right now, there's a sort of a sense in the labour movement that if you pay the freight, in other words, if you've got the money from a, from being part of a big union or whatever, you should be calling the shots. And I don't believe in that uh, philosophy at all. I believe that if you want to bring people into the labour movement, then people with uh, less access to power, with less resources, should be treated as equals, and we should give them opportunities to progress up through the ranks um, and and have a more um, egalitarian-looking labour movement than what we've got right now. So. Uh, and if we don't, I think it'll die in the vine because there's just so many people out there coming from Somalia and uh, you know um, Muslims and Arabs and uh, coming to Canada, and they're not seeing themselves represented in the labour movement. So consequently, um, like 50% of the population in Toronto right now um, are people of colour. Right. And if we can't reach out to those folks, and we're not, because I know when I have union meetings, I see all these white faces, then we're not reaching out to them. And if we're not, then the labour movement's going to die. So I think we that's the challenge of our time for, for us at least. And so what do you see yourself doing? Anything differently in the next 10 years or something? Or is there a different approach or same approach and keep at it? Well, what we've done is, uh, since I came in here, is we've built what we call a common front. So I brought together like 90 separate organizations, everything from people representing the Asian community, the black community, uh, Arab community, um, poverty activists, uh, healthcare activists, senior citizens. Um, you know, and So we brought them all together, 90 separate organizations. And I think that's the way of the future. I actually think that the labour movement has got to be seen and able to identify with people in our communities. Last weekend was like it was manna from heaven for me. There was a big demonstration um, around jobs, justice, and climate. So we were finally bringing together uh, the vision that I've had for a number of years. Finally came together. Now I didn't pull it together. Other people worked on it. Mm -hmm. We were part of it. Um, but it's the labour movement with the environmentalists, with the indigenous peoples with poverty activists. Um, it doesn't get any better than that as a, as a political movement and um, and all calling, you know, all underneath the umbrella of, uh, if you will, of jobs, justice and the climate. And climate change is the, um, it probably is the issue of our era. Like, uh, everything flows from it. Like, the fossil fuel, carbon-based economy that we've got right now um, is not working for the average worker out there. It may have done so, you know, four decades ago. It's not any longer. The jobs have been shipped offshore. Um, the cost of electricity is driving businesses out of Canada. And um, workers can't afford to be paying the electricity rates, particularly if you're at the low end of the income scale. Food is is uh, is uh, excessively high in costs. So all of those issues, and of course, the jobs. There are no decent jobs that now out there. You're graduating from university today. Good luck. Um, you're coming out with a mountain of, uh, of debt and you're graduating into what we call the Mac jobs. Like there are very few really good paying jobs out there anymore. So um, so the, this coalition coming together uh, is exactly where I see the labour movement should be, right smack in the middle of it. There's been a problem in the past where we've always focused in on the short term, uh, or in the short term I should say, on jobs. Mm. We're always afraid that if you try to team up with the environmentalists that they'll shut down all these good paying jobs. Um, and we said, hey, maybe if we start looking 10, 15, 20 years out and you start to transition away from the carbon based economy into more greener type of energies, maybe there'll be good paying jobs there too. When you think about those windmills, um, you know, any one of those windmills, those towers, 200 tons of steel alone just in the tower. Uh, they see nothing of those massive big blades, 2,000 moving parts inside the turbine, all have to be maintained by highly qualified mechanics and technicians when, they, when they're installed. And you can't ship those jobs to China, you can't maintain those pieces of equipment from China, right? So, so now you're moving towards a, a renewable source of energy, um, and at the same time you're providing good paying jobs. So when you look at the climate, uh, you know, 20 years out, uh, and you look at green jobs and the changing of the economy, you can start to see maybe what the economy might look like and maybe we can start to generate those good paying jobs. 
And I'm also just going to ask you, I mean, we have the lovely painting of the Aboriginal um, artist behind us. Uh -huh. um, in terms of fighting for, you mentioned human rights, human right. justice, social justice, and minority groups, um, you did sort of touch upon that you've, you've worked with uh, Aboriginal. I mean, yes. Is there anything ongoing right now that is bringing them more into the fore to ensure that they're more equally represented? Yes, well, um, there's a few things, actually. Um, one of the big ones is it's a, it's a climate change uh, uh, conference or, or rally that took place there on the weekend. Um, that's probably the bigger of the movements that I've been involved with where the Aboriginal communities are playing a central role. But I think practically throughout my career though, I've, I've worked with the, with the Aboriginal communities um, on different projects, you know, stopping them, um, you know, uh, the water, um, for example, um, they were, what's it now, ne Nestle is it? And, the bottled water? Uh, yeah, I did the bottled water campaign. I went on a bottled water campaign. Uh, and we worked with the Aboriginal communities across mm -hmm. the north uh, in many instances to um, to try to get communities to turn away this, particularly these the um, particularly the city councils. So Maud Barlow and myself essentially mm -hmm. travelled to 21 cities, and uh, we were successful in a lot of cases. When was that? Um, it was about uh, it was just before I came to OFL president. Okay. So we're looking maybe six years ago. Okay. Yeah, I travelled across the north with her, and um, and then we we stopped up in the I think it was the Caledon area where there was going to be um, uh, this pristine. Uh, surface water, uh, groundwater that was going to be polluted, they felt by uh, or drained by uh, Nestle. Uh, they'd gotten rights, and uh, and the Aboriginal community came out in huge forces to uh, mm -hmm. basically stop it. So, uh, so we've had. Uh, I've been working with on and off, I say, on individual projects with the Aboriginal community. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, involved with Idle No More. We went to Europe and Ottawa with uh, Chief Spence. I uh, went to visit her in, in, uh, in the tent up there and uh, on the little island, mm -hmm. uh, Victoria Island, I believe it was. So, uh, so I was there, spent an evening there, and then marched with them the next day. So yeah, any, anywhere we can lend support uh, to the Aboriginal community, because I, I believe, by the way, they're most, probably the most politically potent force in Canada. When they put their minds to working on a project and they put their minds to say, we're going to stop, whether it's this pipeline or whether it's whatever the case may be, or memory, we all remember Oka. Mm -hmm. um, these folks, they can get mobilized and they can they can do good work. So uh, I think it's pretty potent if you can bring the labor movement and the Aboriginal community and environmentalists and poverty activists like we did last weekend together. It's just unstoppable force if you can if you can find the issue that we and climate I think is the issue that we all agree upon. Everyone can agree on that one issue. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's basically it. I mean, is there anything else that you wanted to say about your personal achievements or any personal legacy that you'd love to? Um, no, other than I, I, yeah, no, I just go back to the human rights. Yeah. Um, you know, I did some work in um, in Northern Ireland with the peace process in Northern Ireland. Given, of course, I'm from Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so I worked with uh, with both sides. So we were I went over three or four times. Uh, Are you still working? Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I still work with with the um, with what's called Friends of Sinn Fein now, which is a political party which is now coming to the fore. Jerry Adams, uh, right. photograph Jerry Adams over here. Yeah. Um, he, uh, you know, he has moved um, mountains in Ireland in terms of the the political agenda, uh, and now he's working in the south of Ireland where I'm from. Uh, he's a leader of the party and they're doing exceptionally well. And some people are saying they may even win the next election. So I did some work there. I did a lot of work in uh, in South America, down in Argentina. Uh, and what, just general? What we did was we had a worker-to-worker -worker exchange on healthcare. So we decided that healthcare, we, we have a lot to learn from South Americans um, who in some cases have stopped the privatization of healthcare in their countries. So um, about 15 years ago, maybe a bit less, maybe 12 years ago, uh, I had some contacts, uh, friends of mine, who uh, have contacts in South America. So we pulled together in Niagara Falls, um, six separate countries where we brought frontline workers is what we wanted. So we didn't particularly want politicians, or we didn't want necessarily union leaders. We wanted frontline workers who worked in the healthcare systems mm -hmm. in those countries. Um, and we had our first meeting in Niagara Falls. Uh, and shared ideas back and forth about you know how do you fight privatizations and the kind of trends that they see and I mean Cuba was there. Cuba's got one of the best healthcare systems in the world. They had no resources because of the blockade, um, but they were able to you know talk to us uh, about how um, they are actually you know, their doctors are helping people out in the barrios and helping people uh, out of poverty. So 
we actually grew this. We had about four or five of these meetings, um, the different uh, on an annual basis, different different countries around the, around South America, and we ended up at the in the end with 19 countries uh, participating, well. uh, with you know with um, participants from 19 separate countries. That I think was 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 amazing to um, the touch base, and out of that. Um, we actually, I got involved in inviting the Free Trade of the Americas because um, George Bush, uh, you know, announced in Quebec City after we had the big battles in Seattle, he announces in, in Quebec City um, that he was going to take these free trade agreements to South America. And of course, the Cubans and the Argentinians and the Chileans, and they had all a different opinion about that, and the Venezuelans. Uh, so, um, so we actually, uh, I was part of. Uh, mounting uh, the campaign to basically to defeat uh, the uh, the free trade of the Americas. So that was yeah that was really good. I was on a panel. When with, was that? That was. That was uh, I think that was about 2003 maybe 2004 uh -huh. around the time. Uh, I was on a panel with um, Evo Morales who became the president of Bolivia, um, and then I was selected as the only representative from Canada. To be on the podium with uh, Hugo Chavez when he gave a speech uh, in big soccer field, big stadium of 50,000 people uh, in um, in Argentina, in uh, America Plata. Yeah, and that's when he basically announced the death of the of the free trade of the Americas mm -hmm. because Bush was uh, was actually it was interesting. Bush was staying in a, in a um, what do you call those uh, um, in a ship offshore about 10 miles offshore and had to be flown in by helicopter to the meetings, right? We're in a little hotel in downtown Argentina in Mar del Plata, a small little street, and looked out the window one day and there was uh, Yuko Chavez walking out, uh, being mobbed by people around and getting into his car and all that. Wow, the difference between the two, this guy is loved by the people and he can walk amongst them and no fear, no, no hassle. Um, and Bush has to come in uh, on a, uh, on a and a helicopter uh, with all kinds of people surrounding for security. So. Statement of some kind, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, so that was good. So being involved in, in those kind of battles, uh, I was on the streets of um, Seattle. Uh, I was there for the battle in Seattle. Um, and I just tell this as a last little story. Yeah. So the labor movement, just to give you a bit of a sense where, where you know, they need to change. So, I mean, I got the sense that the, um, before it actually happened, that Seattle was going to be big on, on the political map in terms of free trade agreements and so on. So, so I go out to, um, uh, to Seattle and that morning, like seven o'clock in the morning, I'm making my way downtown. Now the labor movement, they're meeting in a football stadium about seven miles outside of town. And I thought, this is crazy. All the young people are downtown. And this is where the action's at. This is where all the turmoil is taking place. Um, and there were like people from around the world. It was like farmers and environmentalists and unionists. And, and they all came into Seattle from around the world. And they were all downtown working with, the, with these, uh, with these uh, young people. And the labor movement was, as I say, five miles out of town, listening to great speeches. Granted, I went, I went out to listen to a few of the speeches. And I thought, Wow, this is great, but it's not where we should be, you know. And then the labor movement had its march the next day after all the hoopla was kind of basically over. And I thought, see, that's that's what's wrong. We're we're, we're disconnected. We we think that we're separate and distinct, and we don't have the same community of interest as these young kids that were fighting on the streets for the next generation of jobs, basically. You know, we, we lost a connection there along the way somewhere. So. So what so, you learned from that? You learned to. Well, I, I learned the social movements are, are uh, that we have to be connected and. And that basically, in some ways, that's changed my brand of, of, uh, of trade unionism and into what I call um, social unionism, where uh, the labor movement cannot just be looking after its own workers. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I'm a big supporter of this um, Ontario government's uh, uh, registered pension plan, uh, because it doesn't impact upon our members. All our members have pensions, but there are 70% of Canadians who don't. And they have to see the labor movement out there fighting for their issues. Because mm. if they don't, uh, they're never going to want to join with us. And likewise, I'm a big supporter of moving the minimum wage up to $15 an hour. And again, for the same reason, most of our members already have good collective agreements, and very few of them would be in, around the minimum wage area. But uh, unless we're seen to be out there and using our clout and our influence fighting to raise everybody's wages up to $15 an hour, uh, then if we don't, those folks will not see us as friends and allies. So I'm a big believer in, in making certain that uh, we are identifying with 
issues that don't necessarily impact our members. Free tuition, another one. Free university tuition. I understand why we don't have that in this country. We have it in Ireland, tiny little nation. 17 OECD countries have it. Why can't we? If we're spending like $35 billion on F-35 fighter jets, uh, why can't we spend $5 billion a year on free university? And who the hell's going to attack Canada anyway? Then we need we need F-35 fighter jets, right? So, I mean, these are kinds of issues that occupy me today. It's, it's like, where, how can I put the labor movement in behind uh, other social movements that need some help? And then working together with those. And, and working together with them and treating them as equals. Like, because you can't just go out and say, oh, we've got the money, you don't, therefore we make the, we make the decisions, we call the shots. You have to open up the movement and um, there's, a, there's a consensual thing happens, which the labor movement, we're not good at consensus. Um, we're good at making decisions because we're a top-down hierarchical movement and we're great at telling people what we're going to do. Not so good at sitting there listening to people and having them uh, be treated as equal partners and, and also um, be part of the decision making. We're not great at that. You have to get better at that, and we have to get better at it, and I think we are. Uh, I mean, that's that's the kind of you know movement that I want to leave people is one that's opened up, and people see uh, that the Ontario Federation of Labour is like the crossroads uh, of social movements, where you know people can come together here from all walks of life, from all social movements, and feel that they've they've got an ally and a friend and a home here at the Ofo. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on the History of Social Change podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Birnbaum, publisher and editor of Sea Change magazine and producer of the History of Social Change project. Be sure to stay tuned as we discuss other social change movements that have transformed the landscape of Canada and the way we live our lives.